Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. It is my honor to be here with you again with my great friends from the Africa Center for Strategic Studies with Kate Almquist, Ray, uh, Ray Gilpin. For those of you who, for if this is your first interaction with ACSS, please just know that this is one of the uh, most important institutions that we have in the United States, uh, not only to help us continue our engagement with the continent, but also, frankly, to educate the rest of the US government about what's happening here. And these sorts of linkages that are developed by groups like you coming to uh, engage with us are extraordinarily important, both for Africa and also for the United States. So to all of you, welcome. Welcome to Washington, DC. And let me also thank both Ray for that fantastic introduction and also Michelle for that comprehensive and excellent presentation. As uh, Raymond mentioned, I have been the dean of the Elliott School of International Affairs, which you can see directly right that through that window, uh, right from here. Um, uh, I've been the dean for just over a year. I started on October 1st, 2015. And on that day, I gave a speech, not unlike this one, uh, to uh, all the assembled uh, senior leaders of the university and students, and I did something that one does not do very often in academia. I made a declaration. I declared that the Elliott School would have a new Institute for African Studies by the start of the next academic year. And it's done. It is up and running. with the intent for it to be the most important uh, academic institution, certainly in Washington, and ultimately one of the most in the United States for the study of contemporary African issues. Now, why did I do that? The most important reason is that I believe strongly that you cannot be a serious student of international affairs unless you have a strong understanding of what is happening in Africa. The reason is that virtually every major collective challenge that the world is facing today is at play on the African continent and usually at much higher stakes in Africa than it is elsewhere. Whether that is the importance of economic growth or the importance of collective security arrangements or how one addresses climate change, et cetera, et cetera. But let me take a much broader philosophical step back and just ask the question, a rhetorical question, which I'll begin to give some answer to. And that is, what is Africa? I would submit that Africa is more than simply a continent. Africa is an idea. The idea of Africa is that all of its people can work together in common purpose, for common prosperity, for common security, and for shared dignity. The reason that broad idea is important is because that conception of Africa can have, I would argue, indeed does have, very real consequences for the practice of international affairs. Indeed, I would argue that you could actually talk about Africa, the idea of Africa, and indeed the role of Africa in international affairs in a way in which you cannot talk about the role of the Americas or the role of Asia. The next comparable concept to that in actual practice in the world might be to talk about Europe, but even that conception, frankly, is under threat uh, now, as we've seen with regard to the politics that are happening in the European Union. And this is actually one of the great ironies. Even as Europe, with its 50 plus year uh, uh, exercise in continental integration, is seriously challenging and questioning that idea, most dramatically with the exit of uh, Great Britain from well, the, 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 the vote of the people of Great Britain to exit the European Union uh, and challenges under Greece. Even as that idea of continental unity is coming under threat and question, it is actually the idea of continental unity and its consequences and its prospects is actually growing stronger and stronger in Africa. And that is happening in no place, in no area, much more, more strongly or more quickly or more in a more pronounced way than in matters of peace and security on the continent. Let me explain that a little bit and why I think that is of significance for today. The 
basic approach to the uh, idea of continental integration in Europe, as you all know from your history, is that it started after World War II with the idea that having had two major wars in the space of a generation and a half, Europe simply could not afford to do that to itself again. But rather than focusing first on political unity or certainly military unity, the idea of Europe started with the uh, uh, European coal and steel community with the idea of economic integration first on the premise that the more those economies were linked, the more it would necessarily lead to greater political integration, et cetera. Africa arguably started exactly the opposite. The idea of African unity as, as an organizational concept, obviously flowing from the ideas of, uh, of pan-Africanism advanced by the likes of uh, Kwame Nkrumah and others, started first with the OAU with its principal, principal objective it would being to liberate the continent from colonialism and apartheid. So it basically started with a political idea, with everything else following from that. And when, with the, fall, with the fall of apartheid in 1994, and as African countries started to rethink what they wanted as their Afri as for their continental organization, with the birth of the African Union, although the infrastructure for the entirety of the Union covered virtually, at least on paper, the entirety of the human experience, social, uh, economic, health, uh, uh, political issues, the part that grew more quickly, most quickly, was the matters of peace and security. And arguably, it is this focus on continental approaches, shared approaches to collective security on the African continent that is now, and successes in that regard, that is now leading Africa to be much more um, uh, focused and arguably sophisticated in ideas of economic unity and also political unity. The reason that history matters a little bit is because it gives us a window in trying to understand what is it that is special about the idea of security in the African context, both for Africans themselves and also for, uh, for partners as they try to figure out how to engage uh, with African, uh, pan-African institutions. And also as they try to engage other uh, individual African countries when they are advancing an African agenda and multilateral institutions like the African Union, or like the UN or the, w or the World Trade Organization or other organizations like that. I would submit a few things. The first is that there are very few con conflicts in Africa that are contained within their borders. That is, there are very few con uh, conflicts where even if the fighting is more or less contained, the implications clearly reach across borders, whether that is the flow of refugees out of South Sudan into Ethiopia and into, uh, into Uganda, or the uh, various concern, serious concerns about uh, potential exporting of genocide uh, that, that is coming from ethnic conflict and political tensions in Burundi uh, to the, uh, the impact of Boko Haram across the entirety of the Lake Chad Basin and not simply in Nigeria. As a result of that, and also, frankly, because of, in almost every case, uh, the poorest borders uh, that distinguish uh, one African country from another, it is necessary for African states to take a collective view of their entire security. Not only to find ways to uh, address these security challenges together, but also to analyze these security threats from a, in a way that looks at the impacts on multiple countries. So that is the good news. And that is part of the reason why the uh, Peace and Security Council of the African Union has been uh, significantly effective in identifying threats and also helping to counter threats on a wide variety of uh, bases, whether it was the, uh, the, uh, the decision to deploy uh, an unprecedented uh, health mission to West Africa to counter Ebola, or the decision to uh, launch hybrid missions in, uh, in, in Darfur, or, um, or uh, UN-supported missions in Somalia, or the extraordinary work that they played uh, both in front of the scenes and helping to reverse the uh, coup in Burkina Faso, or arguably behind the scenes and helping to ensure that the last election in Nigeria indeed proceeded in a free, fair, peaceful manner. However, 
It is also important to note that the idea of Pan-Africanism and also its, uh, its manifestation in positive ways is not the totality of the African experience with regard to uh, uh, matters of peace and security. Africa, after all, is comprised of sovereign states. And the nature of sovereignty in Africa is just like the nature of sovereignty everywhere else in the world. Sovereign states have their own interests. And while some of those interests can be appealed to under the banner of Pan-Africanism, some of those interests actually cannot be resolved in the context of Pan-Africanism. And this is the challenge. How does one address these sorts of multilateral, complex, regional challenges to security when the individual interests of African countries do not align? We have seen this, in my view, uh, most strikingly recently in South Sudan and also in Burundi. We've seen it in South Sudan. One of the things I, that I love about no longer being in government is I can be actually much more free about what I say um, and much more uh, direct. Uh, and, and to put it bluntly, uh, most of the countries that have been involved with EGAD-mediated uh, uh, approaches to uh, uh, peace in South Sudan have, at best, non-coincident and, at worst, directly divergent interests in how a peace process is actually delivered in South Sudan. Uganda and Ethiopia do not have the same sets of interests. Kenya and Uganda do not see things entirely eye to eye. None of them see things the same way that Sudan does. And this, as one tries to figure out how Africa can be the first point of, uh, of, the first point of destination in solving its own problems, must be resolved. Because one of two other things will happen. Either conflicts like South Sudan will continue to rage killing Africans, taking African lives, forcing Africans from their home, endangering the security of African women, or they must cede responsibility for resolving these conflicts to supranational organizations outside of Africa, namely the United Nations or others. That, of course, is the basis for the entire international system, however imperfectly it is actually portrayed in practice. I think we can all agree that the former option is better. That is to say that it is much better for Africa to be in the lead in resolving its, the political aspects of its own security problems rather than having them be resolved from outside. Same true is true, quite frankly, with regard to Burundi. I suspect there are different views on the Burundi crisis in this room. I will tell you my personal view, which is that regardless of how one might interpret the Arusha Accords, it was not in the best interest of the people of Burundi for President Nkurunziza to be so steadfast in seeking a third term. It has clearly helped perpetuate tensions and conflict in that country. And I would also say this was the view of the African Union Commission and of many other states outside of the immediate region. However, with a number of heads of state in the region that have an interest in seeking their own further terms in office, uh, again, it's one of the liberties of no longer being in government is to be able to speak so freely in this regard. Uh, the region, frankly, failed in trying to find a peaceful solution to the crisis. And as such, we are still at a low to medium level burn of that crisis uh, that is not over and, frankly, could get much worse. So why do I mention these issues? And I say in concluding my remarks because it goes to the central theme that my understanding uh, is that we're all here to discuss today, and that is leadership. Let me be very clear. So in America, if, if you haven't noticed, we, think, we all think that we're leaders. That's what Americans do. We lead. Even from the, our tiniest little kids, we train our little kids to go be leaders in soccer games. But we frankly often forget what that means. 
leadership doesn't simply mean being in the in a in a position of influence. It certainly doesn't mean necessarily just being you know, winning the race or being the first in line. At the Elliott School, what I tell my students is that leadership is something really quite specific. It's the ability to bring people together around a common problem and getting them to work together to solve their problems together. And thus, our mission at the Elliott School is very simple, and that is to build leaders for the world. And in the context of where all of you are coming from in your security services as citizens of your country, Frankly, and we don't know, just given um, uh, uh, history, how many of you may one day go on to be ministers or even heads of state. It's entirely possible. And I would urge you both to ask of yourselves, to ask of your leadership, to ask of your citizens, how can you lead? Which is to say, how can you bring people together across their differences to see the commonality of their problems and to work together to solve them for the benefit of everyone, for the benefit of Africa, for the benefit of the idea of Africa. Thank you very much. I look forward to your questions.